That afternoon, the LaPointe community gathered for council outside the American Fur Company fort, which consisted of two large stores painted red, a long storehouse for fish at the wharf, and a row of neat frame buildings painted white. This was the commercial center of the island, and a place where much business took place. About a half mile distant were the Catholic and Protestant missions, along with a school, storehouse, several agency buildings, and several log frame homes. By the year 1850, La Pointe had become a relatively large village with an equal array of movable birch bark wigwams and permanent log frame dwellings. It was really quite lovely to behold the alluring mixture of indigenous and frontier cultures and architecture. The population at La Pointe varied at any given time during the year, depending largely on the season. There were about 500 permanent white and mixed race residents, and anywhere from several hundred to more than a thousand native inhabitants. To the south, past the bay and beyond Shawamigan Point, was Odana, a small settlement of Protestant Ojibwe established and led by the missionaries Leonard and Harriet Wheeler. As the Ojibwe gathered for counsel with the agent, they were noticeably apprehensive and frustrated. There was great concern among them that they would be asked to move from their homes, just as Gizigun had expressed. This feeling of apprehension about their future had loomed over the people for the past several years. Hello, Mr. Armstrong, came the vibrant young voice of Julia Wheeler. Well, hello there, little darling, Benjamin said joyfully as the child ran into his arms. Where is your mother? She's coming, Julia said with a brimming smile. The new baby has her attention and made her slow. Well, there's no stopping you, is there? Benjamin chuckled as he teased the energetic and happy child. Julia laughed, but quickly her smile turned. Are they going to tell us we have to move, Mr. Armstrong? Julia asked with a genuine look of remorse. Though she was only five years old, Benjamin could see that she, too, sensed the atmosphere of displeasure. Benjamin thought hard, not wanting to disappoint the young girl. She was such a little sunbeam and a joy to be around. Benjamin wanted to calm her fears and assure her that they would not be asked to move, but he also did not want to lie. It's best for you not to worry about such things. Leave that to the grown-ups. But I don't want to move. Our house and school and friends are here. I like it here. I know you do. Benjamin patted her shoulder while looking around for her mother, Harriet. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Harriet Wheeler said gratefully, almost out of breath as she pushed through the ever-increasing crowd. In her arms was one baby, in her carriage was another, and alongside her was Leonard Jr., Julia's older brother. These days it is impossible to keep up with that little girl. Don't run off like that, she scolded, turning her attention toward Julia. Yes, Mum, Julia said with a soft look of guilt. Harriet was a kind-looking woman with a narrow face and soft blue eyes. Her curly hair was wrapped in wool, and she wore a long winter coat to shield her from the cold. She was tall and thin, but what Benjamin noticed most was her sense of duty to her calling. She was always busy always occupied, caring for her children, tending to the gardens, or giving lessons to the Ojibwe at Odana. We made it here just in time, Harriet said, giving her attention back to Benjamin. These trips to the island can be difficult, especially during winter. The last thing we need is to be moved 200 miles west. Quite honestly, I'd rather be going home to Massachusetts. Harriet's face drooped below her eyes, and her posture slacked. She was visibly worn and tired. During Benjamin's brief time in the region, he came to discover that missionary life was hard on a family. It was indeed a life of sacrifice and privation. No one is enthusiastic about the prospects of removal, Benjamin said, trying to shield his voice from the children. It has been weighing on this community for too long. Leonard says he will not let it happen, though I don't know how he intends to accomplish that, Harriet said while rocking her baby gently and at the same time bouncing her carriage softly. If anyone can do it, he can. As Benjamin and Harriet continued their conversation, the crowd around them grew rapidly. Attendance was actually somewhat light due to the fact that it was winter and many Ojibwe families were dispersed on winter hunts. Nevertheless, the council was of great interest. Everyone who could come did. Ojibwe of La Pointe, Bad River, and the vicinity, the agent declared as the council was finally ready to start. 
I have an important announcement sent to me from the Commissioner of Indian Affairs in Washington. The LaPointe community gathered tightly around the agent, eager but worried to hear what he had to say. Even those traders and merchants that would not be required to remove had something to lose if the Lake Superior Ojibwe were forced west into Minnesota territory. The agent, John Livermore, was a Democrat who had been appointed just a year prior. His role was as an intermediary between the Ojibwe bands at La Pointe and the United States government. He was just one of several agents who had been appointed to La Pointe over the years. The Ojibwe had grown accustomed to these changes and the varying methods of each agent. They knew that no matter who represented the government, it was important to take his orders into account. The commissioner has asked me to inform you that the time to remove has come, Agent Livermore announced. The crowd, Ojibwe and others, let out a unified groan followed by scattered commotion and audible shouts of dissatisfaction. Agent Livermore was prepared for such a reaction and waited while the crowd expressed its anger. This is for your benefit, he shouted as the commotion began to die down. The location selected for you has not yet been determined, but will be on or near the upper Mississippi. Your land will be plenty, the lakes are filled with fish, your kinsmen will be near, and the white settlers will be far away. There, in this new region, you will be able to continue your ways of living for many years to come. Your annuities will be paid there, the traders will meet you there, and your great father will continue to provide for you. I tell you again, this will be for your benefit. The commotion rose once again. As Julia stood beside Benjamin, he could see a look of confusion and dismay on her face. He placed his hand on her head, trying to comfort her, while thinking of his wife, Charlotte, and his two young children. Then, as the commotion reached its climax, the great buffalo, Keshwashika, chief elder among the LaPointe band, raised his walking staff to calm the crowd. You see the people be excited, the elder statesman said in imperfect English. This is not what we've been told just some years ago. The man who came here to make the treaty told us we did not have to remove for many years. He say our children and grandchildren could stay here for many years. I was an old man then. Even my fire has not yet gone out. And now you say we must remove? The treaty Keshwashka spoke of was signed in 1842 between the Lake Superior Ojibwe and the United States government. This treaty was often the topic of conversation among the Ojibwe at La Pointe. According to the treaty, the Lake Superior Ojibwe sold their lands in Wisconsin, but they maintained the right to live upon and use the land. They were told by the agent at the time that they would not be required to remove for 50 to 100 years. Now, eight years later, that promise was being broken. These were not my words, Livermore said. I merely communicate to you the orders of your great father. He is not our father, and we are not his children. We speak now with you. If you tell us to remove, you break our treaty agreement. You destroy our alliance. I have destroyed nothing, Agent Livermore replied while taking a step back, perhaps feeling under siege. He had two armed guards behind him and an interpreter at his side. You signed the agreement. You sold this land. Now you must accept those terms and move west. This is the pleasure of the president. Undeterred, Keshwashka took a step forward. This is not what was said to us. We were told we could stay here until our annuities had ceased. We were told that our young men could grow old here. The agent took a deep breath, his face almost hidden beneath his muskrat fur cap and behind his wool scarf. You should not be governed by any conversation you had, only by the words of the treaty itself. This is a great wrong, shouted Oshoga, one of the chief elders like Keshwashka. Though middle-aged, he was a fit, robust-looking man. The words that come from the mouth mean the same as yours on paper. The great father, as you call him, cannot say one thing and do another. We do not agree to move from here. We never did. The crowd became excited once more. Shouts of derision flowed from the mass of people toward the agent. Benjamin, though no more pleased than the crowd, stood in quiet observation and apprehension, with concern for his friends, family, and community. The agent replied calmly, I would advise you to heed the wishes of the United States government. Believe me when I say that it is the intention of your great father to do you justice. 
Submit yourselves to whatever your great father should in his wisdom think best to do in this matter. And if we refuse, Oshoga said, to refuse would be a great folly. If you remain here, your annuities will not be paid to you and your families could grow cold and hungry. If you remain, your great father will no longer bestow his gifts upon you or upon your people. It would be a grave mistake. With the support of the crowd at his back, Oshoga answered the agent. We lived many years before the Great Father came to this land. We survived the British who are now gone. We survived the French who are now gone. This was and will remain our home. Our children were born here. The graves of our fathers lie here. We gave you the pelts of our animals. We gave you the lumber from our trees. We even gave you the minerals from beneath the rocks on our shores. But we did not sell our own graves. We did not sell the ground upon which we lie. This you cannot have at any cost unless you wish to take our lives as well. Ho ho, the crowd cheered in agreement. Even those non-natives such as the missionaries, clerks, traders, and miners applauded in acquiescence. If the Ojibwe were forced to remove, their lives would be changed too. Very well, Agent Livermore answered, his voice echoing off the long storehouse. I have told you what you need to know and have completed my obligation. I will tell my superiors of your objections. The specifics of removal will be brought to you at a later date. What you choose to do will be up to you. The agent quickly turned to leave, determined to move beyond the uncomfortable circumstances. He was ushered out by continuous yelps and moans of a community in defiance. So, we must leave our homes? Julia asked, tugging Benjamin by the hand. No, Julia, it will be okay. Benjamin looked softly into her eyes, and with a sense of pity, he wondered if she was old enough to know the truth from a lie. As Benjamin looked up, Harriet pursed her lips in acknowledgment of his kind words. Come on, Julia, she said, reaching out her free hand. It's time to go. 